Our text for today comes from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy near the end of the book. It is instruction for the nation of Israel who has been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and now stands on the precipice of the promised land. To a nation that has lived in the wilderness for two generations after they left Egypt. This is important instruction for what lies ahead in the land of milk and honey. It sounds so easy, so simple. Life and prosperity, death and destruction, life and death, blessings and curses. How much easier could it be? Cake or death? Is it straightforward? Maybe so, but maybe not. Is it easy? Absolutely not. So here we stand on the edge, on the edge of our culture and a culture from thousands of years ago on the other side of the world. And there are dangers and mistakes that we must not make and that we, we must observe. So we need to step away from the edge. The first danger is that we make a quick and easy identification with this text to say, oh yes, it's just like we are. These people are living the same circumstances that we live. The second danger is that we make once and for all answers and interpretations of the text. That all we need to do is make an interpretation once and that will last us for all of our lives in every circumstance and situation. And the third danger is that we practice victimized responsibilitylessness. That is to say that we do not recognize that our own choices have impacted where we are going and what we are doing and how we are to interpret this text. Deuteronomy's context is a complete shift, a shift from wilderness dependence on God by default to unlimited choices and seductions via land, power, and wealth. The nation of Israel has been wandering through the desert for 40 years. It is as if the GPS has been slapped one more time and finally begins to function. In 1.2 miles, turn right. So now Israel is preparing to exit the wilderness interstate, if you will. Preparing to tell the children to put their shoes back on and put their games away. Reminding them about this new place that they are going that they are not familiar with. Maybe they've never been there before. In this case for them, no. Reminding them that even though grandmother is going to offer you candy, don't eat it before supper or it will ruin your appetite. And whatever cousin Billy says, don't do anything to the cat that you wouldn't want done to yourself. So now they come from a complete dependence on God, for that is the definition of wilderness, to unlimited choices and seductions. Three things, land, power, and wealth. 
our context is somewhat different. If we look at ourselves as a nation, which we are often called to do by our culture, we are 200 years and more, and billions of choices and many, many temptations and seductions past the Eden of Deuteronomy. And if we try to place ourselves back there, we're not only denying the 200 plus years of God's grace and bounty that has been poured out upon us, but we are also denying our own culpability in making this bed in which we lie. Now when the author says life and prosperity, death and destruction, it is really about recognizing that every choice is moving us in one direction or the other. And even when we make no choice at all, we are still moving in one direction or the other or at least the directions are moving past us. So are we saying that there is one good choice for each situation, or that we have the capacity to easily decide and differentiate between the choices, or that the choices are once and for all? No, no, and no. What we are saying is that grace is always gray, and the choices must be made each day. So sitting on the edge of the promised land, knowing that choices are there every day and that our options are about to expand exponentially, we also know that we can't sit still until the right choice becomes obvious. We can't take a magic pill or read a magic book, including the Bible, and suddenly get it. It's not that easy. It takes a lot of work. We can only read and pray and think and discuss among those seeking to be faithful and then we have to make a decision. And after that, we can only pray that by the grace of God our imperfect decisions can be redeemed by the one whose plans will not be thwarted by the likes of us or anyone else for that matter. So for us, in what way are we waiting to swoop down into the land of milk and honey? Well, whatever way it is, I can tell you this, our problems are not going to be solved by Democrats, Republicans, Tea Partiers, or even Libertarians. The world that God intends will only come when people of faith struggle with the gray and allow the light of grace to critique all of our choices. Political, the choices of who we vote for and why we vote for them and how we hold them accountable our military choices about how we respond and where we send troops and where we don't, and when we are attacked, what tactics do we use, the cultural choices of what cultures we choose to be a part of and find ourselves a part of, and how our culture interacts or refuses to do so with other cultures. Our economic choices are not just about what we do with our money, but what we don't do with our money, what we buy and what we choose not to buy, and what we do with the money when we don't choose to buy. And our religious choices are the same, how we practice our faith and how that intersects or doesn't the practice of others' faiths. Anne Lamott, one of my favorite authors, said in one of her pieces years ago that being a disciple of Christ is about figuring out how to do the next right thing. The next right thing doesn't mean that the right thing was done last time but only that we have an opportunity to do the right thing this time. So when the author says choose life, prosperity, blessings, there are really at least two completely different choices that can be made. The first choice is offered by the world and when you step away from this place today and each day you will be challenged by these offerings. The world says there's never enough stuff. Always try to get a little more. The world says the most powerful tools we have are power and might. Not might as in maybe, but might as in strength. The world says we are to pad our portfolio and to maintain control at all cost. The world says circle the wagons, bolt the door, make sure we know who's coming and going and control that. And finally, the world says, above all else, be a good consumer. Watch TV, read the magazines, the newspapers, listen to the radio, watch the videos, read the books, and see the movies. 
and to make sure that whatever you get that there's always room to get more. 3G, it's not enough. We need to have 4G, the world says. But you know, there's another choice for that. God has choices also. Instead of never enough stuff, God says, the Lord is my shepherd, I have enough. Instead of practicing power and might, God says the greatest tools we have are love and right. Instead of portfolio and control, God says, Gifting and trust are what it's all about. And to the world's command to bolt the door, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. The answer about being a consumer that God has is to recognize we are not consumers. We are, in fact, those who have been given responsibility to take care of the universe's possessions for a brief time. And that makes us stewards. So for those of us who've been 200 plus years in a promised land, we have a task to do. We have to examine the things we possess and the things by which we are possessed and ask ourselves this question. How has my stuff distorted and obstructed my vision of and passion for choosing the next right thing, for choosing life? Choosing good, choosing God's plan. In our mission partnerships, we learned a little bit about this. When we return from working with people in other countries, particularly in developing countries, the mantra often goes like this. You wouldn't believe how strong their faith is but it doesn't end there because it concludes with, and they've got nothing. You wouldn't believe how strong their faith is and they've got nothing. Well, I've said it myself, and now I realize that this is a stinging indictment that too much of our faith is in our stuff. When Jesus talked to the rich young man who had followed the commands of God all his life but wanted to know how he could gain eternal life, Jesus had a simple answer. Sell it all, he said. But you know that wasn't because the church budget needed the cash for programs or ministry or administration. The reason Jesus said sell it all was because the stuff stood between the young man and a living faith. Choosing God, as the Deuteronomist tells us, whether that's life or good or however else we want to describe it, is about recognizing who controls and owns it all, a question of stewardship. And it's about putting more trust in God than in stuff, about living by the abundance of grace, gray as it may be, and not dying by the abundance of anything else. Martin Luther King once wrote, Find something that you're willing to die for, then live for it. The message of Deuteronomy is a message of grace. Find something you're willing to die for, then live for it. When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? And when it's all been said and done treasure